It's a pleasure to welcome New York Times journalist Roger Cohen to the Kennedy School. And Roger, you've been with us for a month as a Fisher Fellow at our Future Diplomacy Project. We really appreciate all the efforts you've made to interact uh, with our students and faculty. And I wanted to ask you about your career. I mean, in many ways, I'm a former diplomat. You are a journalist. We're in the same business. We're involved in international politics. We're consumed by the great uh, ideas and events of our time. But, but we have diff very different roles. And mm -hmm. I know you've been on the front lines overseas at a lot of the most dramatic moments of the last 20 or 30 years, Sarajevo uh, during the siege of that city by Milosevic, uh, Iran during the stolen election mm -hmm. of 2009, what is particularly memorable to you and important as you look back at some of the stories you've covered? Well, for me, uh, covering war began in Beirut in the 1980s, and of course back then one was filing by telex. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's amazing to think how much um, Communication has changed over this span of 30 years or so, and there are advantages because now you're always connected. On the other hand, back in Beirut, I could tell my editors, I'm going off into the mountains to see the Druze, and I'll be back in contact in four days. And you were completely immersed in whatever situation you were in, whereas now you have your device, and uh, you that experience, with the home that's right, and that yeah. experience of being totally in one place is somewhat diluted. But certainly, I'd say Beirut in the 80s, covering the Bosnian War, um, for somebody in my generation suddenly to be plunged into a war in Europe, concentration camps, mass expulsions, mass killings, millions of refugees, 100,000 killed, um, Tehran, summer of 2009 after the election, Tahrir Square during the Egyptian uprising, covering the fall of Pinochet in Chile. These were all, in all these moments you see human nature really bad before you because under situations of such extreme pressure, the various layers of protection that we all have in our regular daily lives tend to be stripped away. So as an observer, as a journalist, uh, and I'm a journalist very interested in people, and I've always tried to tell stories through people, to have that kind of raw experience, raw confrontation is, is very powerful. Sometimes it's disquieting because of course you see grief-stricken people mm -hmm and you write about them and their grief continues and, and you move on. And sometimes that can feel difficult, but um, it's been a great um, privilege to have witnessed some of these events. You've seen uh, unbelievable and unspeakable tragedy and sufferings. You've referred to some of them, Sarajevo for instance, but you've also witnessed heroism. I mean, certainly on the ground. I remember you telling me about the way that Iranians stood up for themselves. Mm -hmm and stood up for their freedom in June of 2009, or Richard Holbrook, mm -hmm. ending the war in September, November of 95 in mm -hmm. Bosnia. Mm -hmm. Talk about that a little bit. Who's, what stands out in your mind about the more positive side, the heroism of human well, beings? Well, I think uh, you see people who just have tremendous dignity and bravery under extreme pressure, and that speaks to what is noble in human nature. And you see it in a way that, again, is, is not so obvious in other situations. In Sarajevo during the siege, there was an expression in Bosnia, inat. And inat meant showing disdain for the Serbian gunners on the hills who were lobbing shells that were killing pregnant women in the streets. How? By carrying on in your daily life, not running in the street, walking. Uh, of course, when gunfire erupted, people would start running. But in your daily life, to try and show this inat, this, this disdain, by dignity. maintaining your dignity, maintaining your, you know, dressing well, um, pretending that it wasn't happening. And just the courage of people, of course, who um, say in Tehran in 2009, two million people in the streets protesting their stolen boats. And I always wonder what might have happened if those two million had been more forcefully led and had walked on the presidential palace in Tehran. And often in situations of conflict, the outcome really does turn on a knife edge. In Tahrir Square, Mubarak was ousted, could have gone the other way. In Tehran, um, this highly repressive regime, through great brutality, uh, managed to fight back. And you are witnessing, you know, I've witnessed these events both as a correspondent and now as a columnist. And as a columnist, especially, you, you sometimes you have to opine about what you think the outcome will be, and it's, you know, it's very hard, a bit like a diplomat sending a cable, yeah. saying, you know, I think it's going this way. Sometimes you're right, yeah. other times you're not. But um, these situations, I think, are 
very rewarding personally in the end because you're kind of pushed to the limit in what you do. Just in the last two years, you, you saw this great triumph in Tucker Square yeah. of mainly young people yeah. asserting their rights and winning them yeah. and toppling an authoritarian uh, government. Mm -hmm. But you saw the reverse in Tehran. Mm -hmm. You saw the hopes of a lot of people be crushed mm -hmm. by a really despicable and brutal government. Mm -hmm. what, you know a lot about Iran. You've thought a lot about Iran. Mm -hmm. Do you believe that that regime um, of the Ayatollah Hamanai mm -hmm. is going to collapse beneath the weight of its own contradictions and negativism at some point in our in the near future? Well. I don't know about the near future, Nick, but I, I do know that uh, Iranians have been questing since the early 20th century. They rose up in 1905 against the Qajar dynasty. Um, they have a deep religious faith, but they also have a deep desire to have a more decent, more transparent, more accountable, more representative society, a lot like what Arabs throughout the Arab world uh, are now questing for. And I have to believe that at some point, a regime that is so shot through with internal contradictions, having this stand-in for the prophet, the Belayat e Faqih, the supreme leader, Hamanei now, just planted on top of a parliament and other supposedly um, Republican institutions, the contradictions, how are they going to replace Hamanei? I mean, how, how will they find another stand-in for the prophet? Who is that going to be? That is going to be a very delicate moment. Um, there are extreme indications of disquiet throughout Iran because of rising prices, corruption. Um, it is combustible, uh, but you know when you never know. Who predicted the fall of the Berlin Wall? Who predicted the Arab Spring? We have all these pontificators, including myself, all over the place. But very often, in my experience, the really world-changing events are very hard to foresee. And then the importance of the diplomat, the journalist, is you know how you respond to that. Look, look how well the United States uh, responded to the fall of the Berlin Wall, got a united Germany, uh, as we were talking about, into yes. NATO uh, within a year. Who would have you know, predicted that outcome? I, if I could say just a final word, I mean, as a journalist, Martha Gellhorn, the great, once Hemingway's wife, and the great World War II correspondent, spoke about the view from the ground. And you know, these days, it's so easy to write about things by lifting the phone or going online. And, but the view from the ground is what it's all about. Bearing witness is what it's all about for a journalist. To be there, to feel it, to look somebody in the eye, to talk to them, to experience their elation or their pain or whatever they're going through. Uh, that is really, in my view, um, you know, what journalism is all about. And it's expensive. You know, putting people on the ground is expensive. And, and it's dangerous. It's dangerous. It can be dangerous. It's, it can be very dangerous. And moreover, uh, newspapers need resources to do that and as you know the industry is in transition but I do hope and I do believe it's very important that um, US and other media organizations still have that ability because there's no there's no substitute for that and as an observer of diplomacy is my final question mm -hmm. would you also say that, in the, that that it's also important for diplomats to be on the front lines and to be on the street and to have a a sense of the problem firsthand rather than viewing it from distant capitals, Absolutely. even in the age of the information revolution. Absolutely, because that's, you know, when you have the conversation with the opposition leader in, in Egypt or in Tehran or, or wherever, that's when you really begin to dig deep into, into what's going on. And uh, I think it has been very important in Syria right now, for example, yeah. to have a real pro, Robert an arabist, Robert Ford, on the ground. Yeah. And look at look at the impact that a diplomat can have, and that's yes. the great tragedy of, as you know better than anyone, of Iranian U.S. relations is that there has been nobody on the ground for a generation and a half now, and that uh, when that happens, when there's non-communication, is when you can have misunderstandings that can even have tragic consequences. Yes, well, Roger, thank you for everything you've done for our students and faculty here during your stay as a Fisher Fellow. We've been really delighted to have you with thank us. You Thanks for the conversation. Thanks. I did.